So, um, so it's always fun for me to introduce Dean Miller. Um, we've been colleagues and friends on and off for a whole bunch of years, more years than either one of us want to admit to. And um, it's probably uh, worth mentioning that Dean is, is both a venture capitalist and now an organizer and collaborator and, um, and inspirer of venture capitalists in his role as the uh, CEO of PACT. Um, he's, a, he's a very skilled uh, analyst. Uh, in our, one of our previous incarnations, Dean was referred to as Sergeant Friday, in part because he always does the facts, you know, just the facts, ma'am. So for those of you who don't remember the, the TV show, Sergeant Friday was, was a guy who was an investigator who was just only interested in data. And, and that plays itself out very significantly, as you know, in the venture capital world and in, and in startups. Um, in addition to uh, his very substantial credentials in multiple funds, uh, Dean has been a catalyst regionally uh, across, the, across this area, the Commonwealth and beyond, in, um, in moving the needle in, in not insignificant ways and has a pretty good grasp of not only what's going on but what could, what could go on. So uh, those of you that are interested in startup world, you're in the right place at the right time. And without further ado, let me introduce my friend, my colleague, and a really great guy, Dean Miller. Thanks, Thank you so much. <laughs> I do remember that moment, the Sergeant Friday moment. And just for the record, I was hiking in the uh, White Mountains of New Hampshire this weekend with a, a bunch of people and I started to get charged $5 for every question I asked. <laughs> I, exactly. I deflected it into sharing stories so they couldn't keep track too quickly of the questions that I asked. I do like the facts. And I'm going to present some factual information to you here today. But I first want to thank uh, Donna and your colleagues in Jefferson for inviting me to speak here. It's always uh, fun to come to a group that includes students, researchers, faculty, staff. Um, this is where the rubber meets the road when you're talking about the creation of science. And uh, it is uh, an exciting place to be. So um, I know we've got some folks that are in, in uh, Abington. Hello in Abington. We're actually going to come visit you. And when I say we, we mean PACT. We're coming to do a digital health event at your facility in March, just in a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm sure uh, Donna and crew will get the uh, word out about that. So uh, we're excited to come out to Abington and see what's going on on that campus. Uh, I was here last year. It was Jefferson. This year it's Jefferson and Abington. Next year, what, it's going to be Jefferson and Abington and Philadelphia University. And then, then what's after that? Donna, can you give us just more, right? It's going to be a bigger and bigger audience. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Donna. Um, it is uh, a labor of love. The, helping to grow this ecosystem that we have here in Philadelphia. And I'm going to talk about Philadelphia, but talk about it in the context of what's going on nationally. And really, the, as, as um, uh, the, let me get this right slide, as the, the title implies, it's really an overview of the funders of innovation. And when you say uh, the funders innovation, you certainly think of venture capitalists, VCs. Um, you think of angels. These are rich individuals that fund small private companies. And then you think of some question marks. Well, who else inclu is included in that question marks? Could be a Jefferson. Uh, it could be a corporate investor. We're going to talk about that a bit because it's on the increase when you have corporate investors or any kind of a, a business that actually invests in what you're trying to do. It could be other strategic partners as well, and we'll talk about a couple classifications of those. But there are a lot of different ways that you can fund an idea. Um, to commercialize a piece of technology. And I've had a lot of experience over the years dating back uh, to the late 90s to do so. I've seen a lot of failures. Most do fail. Um, I've seen a number of successes as well. And uh, we can talk about what the differences of those are as well. Just so I understand my audience here, um, I know there's a couple students in the audience. Anybody who's a, a student? Um, uh, research, research slash faculty, probably the rest, right, and staff? And then in Abington, we won't know who you are, but you know who we are. And uh, again, if you have idea or questions, they, they're to email Mark. Is that right? And Mark, however you want to get those to me, please do so. Feel free to interrupt me. And for the people that are here live, feel free to raise your hand in the middle of any 
any topic you want, we can delve a little deeper. What I'm going to do first is give you a little background on PACT um, and just a few more words about my experience. Uh, I came out of uh, graduate school, business school, and got into the investment world uh, on the early stages. So my experience initially was really focused on early stage investment, really company formation right out of universities, labs, uh, uh, people's garages, that really does happen, uh, and their basements. And uh, over the years, have delved into some later stage investing as well. But one of the things, as Donna alluded to, that I took on a couple of years ago was the role of PACT CEO. So what is PACT? I'm going to talk about what PACT is. PACT is an organization here in the Philadelphia region. It's the largest business association that focuses on growing and strengthening the entrepreneurial community here, primarily from the perspective of entrepreneurs and investors two key elements to any entrepreneurial ecosystem, but also includes universities, medical centers, um, and just like Jefferson's involved, so are a number of others or most others in this region. Uh, it includes corporations, large corporations as big as Pfizer or a Vanguard that are interested and focused on that next generation of innovation and how they either use it, buy it, or partner with it, or actually even grow it internally. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about corporate involvement um, as we proceed as well. It includes other organizations such as a Ben Franklin or a Science Center that are also supporting the ecosystem. Uh, and then it also includes professional advisors, lawyers, accountants, bankers, the kinds of folks when you want to form a company that you call first. Even before you're calling about capital, you're calling to figure out how do I actually form this company? What are the tax impl implications of the structure and all those kinds of things? We're not going to get into that today. So PACT as an organization has been around for about five, a little over five years. And uh, we have a group of supporters. We call them our founding supporters. They support us at the highest levels in terms of their uh, individual involvement, their organizational support, and their financial support of, the organiza of our organization, PACT. A passionate group of an individuals and entities that are, again, focused on helping us with our mission to grow and strengthen the region. They're investors, they're big companies, they're universities, they're professional advisors. There are a myriad of different types of entities and, uh, again, are, are not alone in their efforts to support the community that we just call them out given the size and scale of their commitment to what we're doing. Um, from an executive committee perspective, uh, we are led by Jonathan Brassington, the CEO of Liquid Hub, a close to $200 million information technology company. Um, uh, Frank Hermance is the chairman and CEO of Amitech, a previous chairman of our organization. Mark Letterman, a venture capitalist in the region, also a previous uh, uh, chairman of our organization. And uh, rounding them out, Michael Harrington, A.J. Jordan, is, and uh, Charles Robbins. Included with, uh, with the PAC team, I've got six folks full-time that really focus on our core mission. We're affiliated with the Chamber of Commerce, and they help us with all of our back-end services and support, and really as collaborators. But this group of six, in addition to myself, really focus on our core mission. And what do we do? We provide a host of different events, programs, and services to early stage to mature companies. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Our, our vision, our mission is really to be that go-to resource for fast-growing companies. And when we think about it, we think about capital, we think about customers, and we think about coaching. I'm going to delve into those a little bit more. I talked about our constituent base. This is the constituents in list form, but here's kind of a, ge a, a graphical view of our constituents. And you can see the entrepreneurs are in the middle of them. They're really the lifeblood of any community is the entrepreneurs, right, the passion. Um, and in maybe not one removed is the scientists in the case of talking about life sciences, and that's one of the, obviously, the focus points that I'll have here today is focusing on the healthcare sector. I talked about the customers, the capital, and the coaching, um, three C, four C, or excuse me, three Cs, along with uh, community as a fourth C. These are things that we hear when we talk to our entrepreneurs. What, are they, what do you need? What do you need help with? Well, we need help finding customers for our products. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we might be able to do that. We need capital. That might be an obvious one, and there's, that's the primary reason we're here to talk today. We need coaching. We want to hear from people that have done it before that can help us avoid those critical mistakes that you oftentimes make as a first-time entrepreneur. And building of the community, again, is critical to all of those things. It's really bringing them together. And here in Philadelphia, we're, we're blessed with a wide variety of companies, a wide variety of resources that are geographically spread. 
So one of the things we do as an organization is bring those geographies closer together. So you have the suburbs all the way out in 202 in Malvern and Exton and the activity that goes on there. You have what's going on right here um, in Center City and where we sit here today. You have the Navy Yard. You have the Science Center. Uh, you have Northern Liberties increasingly as an area of entrepreneurship and down in Old City. Bringing those communities together on a regular basis is important to do and it doesn't happen naturally. And so that's one of the ways that we do that through programs and events is connecting those different parties and uh, getting them out of their comfort zone, so to speak, geographically. And that's an important thing to build any community. We do it through events, and we have a number of signature events. Uh, our Enterprise Awards is in its 22nd year. Our Impact Capital Conference has just finished its 23rd annual conference. Those bring together over 1,000 people from this community. The whole community comes out. We also do a smaller, slightly smaller events, but also signature. I know somebody just attended our PAC Foundation breakfast that was really highlighting female-led entrepreneurs in the region, both from healthcare and information technology. So we support, we have a 501c3 that supports different initiatives. And right now, we're really focused on women-led entrepreneurship and uh, are funding something called All Ventures, which is an initiative through Ben Franklin to fund female-led entrepreneurship in this region. Huge differences between male and female participation, both from a scientific and entrepreneurial perspective. And uh, we want to try to, to change that in any way, small way we can. Our forum conference is more technology focused, although it also has a healthcare element to it. And that is a one-day technology conference coming up here in April. Those are our four biggest events. But we also do a host of smaller programs. When I say smaller, they can range from a 15 to 20-person roundtable up to a couple of hundred individuals. And we do them based upon individual industry focuses. So we have a med tech event. We have digital, um, digital technology, digital health events. Uh, we do cybersecurity and a number of other areas. Then we also have events just for specific um, uh, functional areas. So we'll get CEOs together or CTOs together to talk about issues that are germane to them. And so when you take all these together, you get about 25 or 30 different programs that we spread around ge geographically, again, to try to bring the community together in different ways. And what we ask of any individual or organization is just to get involved, become a member, sponsor event, host of an event like you're doing here today. And we're thankful and grateful for Jefferson's involvement with PACT. And it's a great way to, again, connect further with the community to get folks who otherwise wouldn't step on, for example, the Abington campus, where we're going to bring probably 100, 150 people next month um, from off of that campus onto the campus to experience Jefferson in a whole new, whole new light. Uh, the other thing I'll touch upon here, uh, just other ways that we get engaged organizationally in giving back. I talked about the foundation and really advancing the region. But we also um, are very focused in growing the capital in the region. And we have an advocate for us in Harrisburg, a lobbyist, that really focuses on identifying capital sources to increase, in particular, early and seed stage capital. Why that? I'll show you some charts in a little while that'll tell you why that's the case. But it is the most underserved area of investment capital, the earliest capital, right? So you have an idea, you try to approach somebody to fund it right out of the gate, it's the hardest ask you'll make in the process. And finding capital can be very challenging. We're very fortunate in Pennsylvania to have had a program uh, by the name of Ben Franklin, you might be familiar with, that has had a 30 plus year life uh, in this commonwealth and really has grown over the years, not just uh, stagnated, but grown. Unfortunately, it did stagnate a couple years ago in the Great Recession, and we worked together with Ben Franklin to advocate for Innovate PA, which is a $100 million tax credit bill. 50% of that money will go to Ben Franklin statewide to increase their level of investment activity at the state and seed stage level. The other 50% of it will go to a vehicle that invests in early stage funds, early stage funders that are putting capital into Pennsylvania-based early stage companies. Again, really important effort and one that we continue to focus on new and innovative ways with the Commonwealth as well as outside of the Commonwealth, with the city as well, on how to fund um, this really important stage of capital. What's the overall economic impact of venture capital? Maybe taking a step back here, sometimes you ask yourself, okay, well, why is it so important? Um, is it really an important part of the economy? And candidly, it's a small piece of the economy. So if we look at it compared to, say, Wall Street, and venture capitalists do everything they can to separate themselves from Wall Street, and there are reasons why. 
Um, it's a very tiny piece of the overall financial picture. Tiny by comparison. We'll talk about numbers in the billions, and they're dealing in the hundreds, billions, if not trillions. So it's a small sector that has real importance. What's that importance? Well, if you look over a long period of time, this looks at a 35-year period of time, you can see that a dollar of venture capital produced $8, $8.5 of U.S. revenue. So what it funds is it funds high-growth businesses, businesses that have real potential to change industries and to grow industries. And there are a number of sectors that truly wouldn't exist if it wasn't for venture capital. So when we talk about jobs, and that's something obviously uh, in the limelight this year with the presidential elections, or any election for that matter, but job creation is critical. We're talking about 11, over 11% 11 of private sector job creation through venture capital. We're talking about a significant chunk of the GDP. And we're also talking about a high, high percentage of these sectors being funded by venture capital. And let's go right to biotechnology, about 75%. I actually think that number's low. Um, and it probably is helped out a lot by the NIH and other funding sources at a federal level, but 75% of biotech truly probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the venture capital industry and taking that risk capital, that early risk. So it's, it's critical. It's critical to the economy uh, from a size and scale perspective, but it's small relative to the over, overall excuse me, financial sector. But that critical, um, that, cr that critical element of the venture capital segment is often overlooked because it is so much um, just shaded by the size of uh, just traditional finance, public company finance, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit about public companies because that is one of the ways that investors look to exit ultimately out of the businesses that you all are going to start. You all are starting businesses, right? I was told that it was this afternoon. Donna, right? Okay, good. Whew. Same in Abington, right? All right. So what does Philadelphia look like? Um, look at the numbers here. The numbers in terms of dollars aren't great. And if you look at the ranking um, on the left side of the slide, you can see that we have slid down the rankings from a dollar perspective. A lot of that has to do with biotechnology, actually. So biotechnology requires a lot of capital, a lot more these days than information technology. And when a company sets out to raise money for a biotechnology endeavor, they do so in the tens of millions of dollars, uh, without exception, really. And the less there are of those, the less there are from an overall number perspective, that middle column of invested in millions. And so we've had less. We've had less over the years. We've always been a center for life sciences, in particular biotechnology investment, a leader. And we're still a leader nationally, but there's just been less of it. Um, why, you might ask? Well, it's hard there are a lot more failures than there are successes. Um, it is a binary outcome very late in the process in m many cases as a result of regulatory hurdles, as a result of scientific hurdles, as a result of, of, result of um, uh, ultimately commercialization hurdles. And I don't have to tell you that. You're, you're on the front lines of it. But from a number of deals perspective, you see that we've actually increased. And from a ranking perspective, I probably did a disservice to this slide in not showing our relative ranking in terms of deal, number of deals. And actually, some of the reading that I was doing just over the weekend has made me say, you know what, I'm going to change this slide. Because we need to have a more positive dialogue here in Philadelphia about how we compare. And in terms of number of deals, we compare very favorably. We're tied for seventh in 2015. Uh, we're consistently in the top 10 where we should be, right? We're GDP number eight. You know, MSA population rank number seven, we should be in the top ten. We are. We are in the seventh, eighth slot pretty consistently in terms of number of deals that are getting funded. And that's a great thing. And that is probably the best measure, as I have really become even more educated recently, than anything else when you're talking about the health of an ecosystem. So we can take good, we can feel good about that as a community, that there are a lot of companies every single year getting funded in the area. Let me just take a quick sip of water and allow anybody to raise a hand that might have a question. Metropolitan Statistical Area. It's, uh, I don't know if it's through the IRS, but it's the federal government that basically says, okay, well, Philadelphia, you can't just say it's Philadelphia, it's, it's Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. So they, they're the ones that define the statistical region. 
and there are several hundred of them across the country, but in terms of relevance statistically, there's probably a top 25 where there's significant activity. There's a couple of others that could rise up and fall down based upon one investment that's big, but for the most part, there's maybe 20, 25. In the back? They're big. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, it is, uh, we'll look at, I don't know if I have um, some specific data around that MSA. I didn't really delve down into it, but it's, it's pretty sizable geographically, too, because they throw in Oakland to San Jose. That's not too small, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, but even if they didn't, it still would be ginormous compared to everybody else. So when you look at the data, it's just, it's an outlier. And that actually comes back to one of the, um, one of the topics of talking positively about what we're doing here. It's impossible to compare ourselves to the Silicon Valley. Um, it's impossible really to compare ourselves even to Boston and New York in terms of size and scale. But on a relative basis, given how big we are and traditionally what we've done, we're doing quite well. Yes, 17th in terms of the investment in millions, yeah, from the middle column. And again, that can, that can change pretty substantially just based on a couple of investments that might be sizable. And you'll see small, much smaller MSAs that are ahead of us as a result of that. All right. Okay, so a couple cartoons. I'm going to just throw them all up here. This is how according to Dilbert, how the venture capital world has really changed. So back in the late 90s, when I started in this business, you know, it really was all about the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur really had the power, um, and it had everything to do with the internet, right? The internet was new, it was exploding, and everybody wanted in on it until it exploded. And so in the early 2000s, the venture capitalists had the upper hand. And when I say upper hand, it all comes down to negotiation, right? How much money are you going to put into my business at what value? And it doesn't matter if you're doing that with an angel or a, or a institutional venture capitalist. That's always the crux of the conversation at the end of the day. We can talk about the technology. We can talk about uh, what value the investor may or may not bring to the table. But it all comes down to how much money you're going to put into my, my company and at what value. And then today, well, today I have a question mark. And today it suggests here that the venture capitalists um, really are out of power, so to speak, that it's still the entrepreneurs. But it's actually not true. So that's actually changed just in the matter of the last couple of months. And you may have read it in the financial pages. Uh, you may have seen it in social media. But just in the last couple of months, there have been certainly public markets that have become depressed. We'll talk about those in a little bit. And the private markets have started to get a little bit concerned about the scope and scale of the valuations of some of the biggest private companies out there, companies like Uber. Um, and others that carry valuations in the multi-billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars, that have really circumvented, in many ways, the public markets to raise capital that public companies don't really raise. And so we're now at a time point where there is increasing concern, global concern, um, concern here in the U.S. from an, eco from an economic perspective, and it's sh switched the... Um, or gradually, I should say, moved um, the paradigm a little bit back toward the venture capitalists in terms of having a little more negotiating power. It's interesting. It literally has happened just in the past couple of months, if not even the past couple of weeks. And, you know, people are, are uh, uh, you know, out there raising capital and having hard times doing it when just a couple of months ago there was no difficulty doing it. Let's take another look at what are the sources over the life cycle. So we talked about angels, we talked about venture capital, but even before that, there are your own sources, right? It's your own capital. Literally, people still use credit cards to fund their investments right out of the gate. Um, they go to their friends, they go to their family. Uh, but that seed stage capital is critical. And there are other sources of it. When you're in an institution like you all are in, um, there is capital through government grants, right? So in healthcare, in the life sciences space, you have that added benefit of having access to 
tap into government grants. And, you know, those continue to thrive for many, you know, they certainly fund, I'm sure, a number of labs here, and they, they certainly fund a number of commercialization initiatives that exist out there. Um, I've had great fortune to invest in companies that have leveraged that capital, and it's tremendous. You know, it's non-dilutive, right? So you don't need to sell part of your company uh, when you get a government grant like that. Um, you know, there are hopefully a growing number of sources. We've heard uh, just in the past couple of weeks with the focus on cancer and hopefully a growing amount of capital that will go into focusing on that. Uh, there's been increasing levels of investment available for research in Alzheimer's and other areas. So, you know, depending on your own specific focus, you can, and you should, if you have entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial interests, look at what are the funding sources that are specific to that sector, because they do change, uh, both positively and negatively, but they do change. So that seed stage capital, the critical capital, is some of the hardest to get. Startup, as we talked about, not much easier. These are the folks that are taking early, early bets uh, before you really have proven much, right? You might have some really early data, um, but not much in the way of data. It's not until you get to the early stages in the middle of the chart that you start to get a little more data, a little more convincing data to show that what you are proposing to do can actually become reality. Uh, you see that at the bottom of the chart we talk about revenue and profitability. This is an oxymoron for biotechnology companies in a lot of regards because they don't become profitable and revenue generating, hopefully, until long after investors have exited from them. But on the technology side, if you're talking about digital health or healthcare services, it's critical. Um, it's critical to have your eye on when that happens and how you're going to get there in producing both revenue and revenue at scale and then ultimately profitability. And that's one of the changes that we've just seen in the past couple of weeks with investors increasingly focused on how much money are you going to spend over the course of the next two months, six months, 12 months? When are you going to need to raise more capital? Because I'm not sure you're going to be able to raise more capital. The public markets aren't there right now, and I'm not interested as an investor in putting more capital into your company until you prove that your product is going to sell or that your service is selling or that your biotechnology drug is actually working in an increasing number of patients. So those dialogues are happening right now and it's becoming harder and harder to do it. The public markets certainly have a lot to do with it. And the public markets, which uh, when I stood here a year ago, were blossoming um, and did so through the first half of last year, uh, really took a turn in the late summer. And through the fall, significant value is lo lost especially in the life sciences space, where you saw many stocks off 60% in their highs. Um, and that really, quite honestly, freaked a lot of people out, freaked a lot of investors out, and uh, made them step back, take a pause, reduce, or I should say, reduce the pace of their investments, and take less risk in the investments that they were making. It's happened now in the technology space just in the past couple of weeks. Let's look at some more data. And let me take a pause there in case anybody has any questions. Seed. <clears throat> it's a seed stage that's again, gets everything off the ground. And the takeaways here is that in 2015, it was kind of an up and down year from a seed stage. But overall, it actually decreased just slightly, but it decreased. Sector-wise, it's interesting. Um, you still see biotech and med device as the largest recipients of seed capital. Now, if I told you that it is incredibly hard to get a biotechnology company through the FDA, uh, product through the FDA today, which, again, I'm, I'm speaking to folks that experience this on a daily basis, or a medical device, which it is, and that there's increasing uncertainty how you do that. Um, and there's increasing uncertainty about the pricing even once you do get to commercialization for a company. And that, oh, by the way, the amount of capital available for biotechnology and med device has been shrinking, not expanding in terms of traditional venture capital. You'd say, well, I wouldn't expect biotech and med device to be really that significant. But it is. It's 65% of the whole pie. And sure, there's drug discovery and there's development and there's other areas that 
are sharing that healthcare seed activity. So what's, what's the reason for it? Well, I think there's still tremendous innovations out there. And there are great, great minds in this room, in this institution, in this city, in this world that continue to chase those great innovations. And forgetting about the challenges, those innovations have potentially tremendous impact on humankind, on health, um, on our lives. And as a result, they continue to achieve that early funding because there is a passion that you cannot replace with innovation that is going on in basic science labs, in commercialization efforts, et cetera. It actually be more uh, because it takes more dollars in those sectors uh, than in the other sectors. So, you know, to do clinical trials, it's not cheap. And it's interesting when you compare it to information technology. We'll talk about digital health there in a few minutes. Back 20, 25 years ago, they were very comparable technology company development and a life sciences company development. It took a tremendous amount of infrastructure build on the technology side to get those companies going. Um, you had, you know, you didn't have uh, clinical trials. Instead, you had to build a whole big computer room, right? And it took a lot of money to do that. Um, you had to buy and build software. It took a lot of money to do that. And since that time period, the cost of starting a technology company has decreased and decreased and decreased to the point that you literally can start a company and scale it with your credit card using Amazon Web Services, for example pretty substantially before you need to do any of that. But yet on the biotechnology and medical device side, very little efficiencies of scale. Um, it continues to cost a lot of money to do so. And there really are very few ways around it. Um, and we probably don't want the ways around it, right? Because it does come down to safety and the regulatory bodies, and we can argue probably it's a whole other session or day even talking about the regulatory body bodies, do serve a purpose. Um, and that safety and those testing, that testing that happens um, both in vitro and then in humans, and that's a critical component of it. It's really hard to get around it. Any other questions? So digital health. So we just talked about technology versus biotech. What does that look like? <clears throat> this is the number of deals. And you see that over the past couple of years, the digital health space is outstripped biotechnology in terms of number of deals. It's become a really hot space. It started to cool off, particularly in the second half of 2015, but it continues to be an interesting segment. It's really a data play. So there is so much data being produced in healthcare from patient records uh, to clinical trial records and everything in between. And the mining of that data and the use of it for a variety of purposes is what really is fueling the digital health segment. We don't have a lot of great examples of big, big companies that have been started up just in the past couple of years that have grown to that scale, but there's still a lot of promise. Um, there's a company up in, um, in New York uh, whose name just flashed out of my head. It's a cancer company that is just raised $200 million from, among others, Google, um, that is focused on taking the data across cancer centers and leveraging that for um, patient-specific plans uh, to improve that whole space. And it's one of the, uh, I'm sorry? No, it's not it. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. It's a company actually named after an area within Manhattan. Um, but in any event, it's a, uh, you know, one of the leaders within the digital health space in terms of capital raised and what they're doing. Uh, and that, again, contributes to that, those numbers. It's given us a lot of promise, I think, from an investor perspective that the confluence of the technology world with the healthcare world could provide not just great investment opportunities, because that's ultimately, as an investor, what we care about. We care about great investment opportunities and returning more capital to our investors than what they gave to us but great technology and the leveraging of technology to produce results that affect patients differently than perhaps a drug or a device, um, but not much less substantial in terms of the efficacy and efficiency that it can bring to a healthcare system or to 
um, specific information in the hands of clinicians. This takes a look at the funding. So we asked, uh, the question was asked here, how would med device and biotechnology be different if you gauge them on dollars of funding? Now we see how that compares to digital health. Digital health was 2x the number of deals, but it's almost identical in terms of dollar value because it's much less money to form a technology company, even if it's in healthcare. Uh, so digital health companies have a lot to do with that. Any questions? Any questions from Abington? All right. We talked about corporates. Um, corporates. Corporates can take many forms, and they've always had a role in healthcare and life sciences investing. Locally, we've had great fortune of having significant assets in terms of pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. Uh, we can think about SmithKline Beecham, Glaxo. We can think about J&J. &J. Uh, we can think about uh, even companies like Shire, all of whom have had venture investment activities, specific venture investment activities. Um, in fact, many of them over the years have been based right here in the Philadelphia region on up through Princeton. Unfortunately, in the past several years, many of them have moved out of this region. Not the companies, so to speak, although there have been obviously some migrations of their staff, but their venture capital investment activities. So Glaxo, which used to have SR1 based here, principally all those people are now out in California or up in Boston. J&J, um, &J, same. Pfizer, same. Um, you have a reduced number of those professionals sitting here but it doesn't mean they're not investing here. They continue to invest here. It's just they're going where the volume of activity is, and we don't have, as I said before, the same level of volume, although we do have volume. And if you look at, and this is a complete eye chart, I realize it, but it just gives you a sense of the, sa of the scale and scope. These are pharma companies, just pharma companies alone that are making private investments over a, a three-year period. It's significant. It's significant, it's growing, and we're gonna look at some data in just a short period of time that talks about what's the size and scale compared to investors, venture capitalists. And I'll tell you, it's, it's double digits, and it's on the increase. Increasingly, these are the folks that are funding more and more of the innovation out there. And they're doing it for a variety of reasons. They're doing it because they have capital. Uh, they're doing it because they have to, right? They have pipelines that they need to fill, and they need later stage drugs. They're doing it because They've reduced their own internal development assets in hopes of identifying the next blockbuster through this activity. Um, they're doing it for, again, a variety and a growing variety of reasons, and more of them are getting into it. You might say, is that a good thing? I think it's a good thing. Um, it's outsourced development for them in many regards, right? So they can reduce their overall cost of development if they do it correctly, and companies like Glaxo now, more than 50% of their pipeline comes from development assets from outside their doors than inside their doors. So it is, it's not a small piece of their overall focus. It's a big piece of their overall focus. And it's helping that overall innovation. Again, come back to the passion, the passion of helping patients. These companies recognize that that still is at the crux of what they want to do. Do they want to sell medications? Do they want to sell more drugs? Absolutely. Do they want to sell more medical devices? Absolutely. But in helping the patients, they see still that innovation, but recognize that their organizations are not the only places that are producing that innovation. Again, it's places like Jefferson, other organizations within Philadelphia and beyond. Within Philadelphia, who are the leaders? Um, the leaders from an early stage, seed stage, I talked about Ben Franklin, but BioAdvance is one of the greenhouses. So several years ago, actually more like a dozen plus years ago, uh, our Commonwealth, in addition to Ben Franklin, created life sciences greenhouses, three of them across the state, to fund early stage uh, technology development, particularly focused in the biotechnology space. And they've been very successful in doing that, um, giving anywhere from 50 up to a half a million dollars to a company at its formation stages. Again, critical dollars that aren't found in many other places. Um, more recently, we see activities like Dreamit. Uh, Dreamit is an accelerator. Um, there are accelerators around the country. 
you'd be hard pressed probably to find uh, too many cities that don't have some form of accelerator. And Dream It's one of the nation's leading ones. Happens to be headquartered right here, but they have activities outside of this region as well. And they attract entrepreneurs both from Philadelphia and outside of Philadelphia to come here for roughly a six to nine month period of time and provide services to them to help them accelerate their business from zero to whatever you can get to. Literally idea stage types of companies. And they, companies compete competitively to try to get into the program. And once they get in, they receive a certain amount of capital, about fifty, twenty-five dollars to $50,000 to help build that initial prototype, to help build that initial data, whatever that might be for uh, their product. They've not done as much on the biotechnology side because you know, that requires wet lab space and a lot more money. Uh, but they do a lot on the digital health space and have had good success in that regard. Um, so they are a form of early stage capital uh, that you might not be aware of. We talked about angels and the angel community, which is a critical aspect around the country. Um, someone had mentioned the Silicon Valley. Out in the Silicon Valley, angel capital is a huge per percentage or proportion of the capital that gets deployed into companies. It is the successful entrepreneurs putting money back into the ecosystem. We see that here as well, a little bit to a lesser extent, but we see that here. And it's both individually done, but also through angel groups. And one of the leading angel groups that we have locally is Robin Hood. Um, I always like to think it's Robin Hood of stealing from the rich to give to the poor. But I think it's taking the rich, obviously, and giving to the poor entrepreneurs that need that capital. And it's well organized and does focus both in technology as well as uh, healthcare or life sciences investments. Moving upstream a little further into organized venture capital firms that focus in the healthcare space. There are some that focus across the spectrum. Safeguard would be one of those. Uh, there are others that want to see, see investments that are slightly uh, uh, further ahead. A new spring, for example, might be one of those. Uh, and then others that straddle, um, um, and those would be Osage and Domain, for the names of firms locally uh, that are institutional venture capital firms that invest in med device and biotechnology as well as services and digital health. Um, you know, those, uh, pr the principles of those firms you know, are, are based here mostly. They travel around the country, if not the world, and do investments outside this region. But if you ask any one of them, they would tell you, I would rather do more investments here in Philadelphia. And we hear this time and time again, not just from the investors, but also from the entrepreneurs. We hear that from corporates that are involved at PACT. And I shared with you that Pfizer, for example, is very involved. We have a lot of the infrastructure here. As I talked to you before, there are quite a number of deals that get done here on an on a, uh, annual basis. So the foundation is here to grow from. Just like you have Jefferson as a foundation from which has been gro experiencing growth in the past couple of years, we also have the foundation here in Philadelphia. The entrepreneurial talent, the capital, and the scientific, most, maybe most importantly, the scientific mind sitting here again in this room, in Abington, in this institution and beyond, to, to create that next level of innovation. So I know I joked about you creating companies, um, but if you have an idea, don't hesitate to mature it, to talk to somebody who might be a little more experienced on the entrepreneurial side to see if it could be something. There are a tremendous amount of opportunities, growing ones within Jefferson and outside of Jefferson, to take that idea and maybe develop it into something. And like I said before, there are many, many failures, far more failures that occur within the entrepreneurial world in the technology and healthcare spaces. Um, but that process, that learning process of going through and figuring that out is invaluable, invaluable to the next entrepreneurial endeavor that you might create, valuable to your own work in your everyday, in your everyday lives, whether that's in a lab or in a classroom uh, or in a clinical setting. And so I'd encourage you to think about it. It doesn't have to be in the traditional case of creating the next biotechnology drug or med device. Um, it could be a service. It could be a single innovation. It might even be a way of doing something that isn't a company but could affect lives. And the process of going through and iterating that idea, maybe into a business plan, maybe getting a little bit of funding to do a trial on it, could ultimately spell the difference of whether or not that idea sees the light of day commercially. And again, it doesn't even have to be a company. It could be just a small way, a small change of doing things in a clinical setting. So I, again, I'd encourage you all to think about it, even if the idea of raising venture capital is daunting to create a company. Again, it doesn't need to be that. So some misconceptions. I'm going to talk about some misconceptions that we see as investors 
in the community. And then I'm going to go to another set of slides that I just um, uh, grabbed this morning. They're fresh, uh, really fresh off the, uh, um, the data mill and uh, some more uh, delving into some data that I think you'll find interesting. So what are the misconceptions? All I need is the idea. Well, the idea is important, um, but you've got to have the passion to see the idea through to something. It's hard to take your idea and hand it off to someone else completely and say, hey, you go, you go do that. Because if they don't have the same passion, it's probably not going to get that far along. Um, so again, the idea is critical, but you've got to have a willingness to move it beyond just that idea stage. You can do it with a team, and I'd highly recommend that you identify colleagues or peers, maybe folks with, with uh, uh, differing skill sets that could be helpful in that process. A great idea plus no experience equals money. So experience is really important. And even if you don't have the experience in developing a product, you want to find somebody who does. Um, not a hard thing to do. There are a lot of experienced people. I just mentioned that we have a tremendous foundation of talent in this region, and that's t completely true at all stages, too, from early stage clinical development uh, into uh, commercialization. We have great assets, in, particularly in the life sciences and healthcare space. So if you've got a great idea but you don't have you have little experience in entrepreneurial endeavors, mm. identify some folks who do. And uh, you know, Jefferson as an organization obviously has existed and grown as a result of entrepreneurial spirit. And I guarantee you, you'll find folks right here on this campus and others that have um, that experience that might be helpful to you. On the flip side, if you don't have an idea, but you've got some entrepreneurial itch that you want to scratch, find somebody who does. Um, you know, walk into tech transfer. Um, you know, talk to Don and their colleagues about what they're hearing, what they're seeing. Identify an idea that maybe you could get really passionate about and bring your own entrepreneurial experience to. You don't have to have both within, the own, within one individual, but you have to have both on your team in order to ultimately successfully raise capital beyond those early stages. Another misconception is that you know, I'll still control my business at the end. I'm going to raise this capital and I'll control my business. And a funny uh, anecdote, I was uh, judging a, um, uh, a business plan competition. And it was an interesting competition in that it wasn't ideas that were generated by the participants. It was technology from an institution that the participants had to build a business around. And that technology had to be integral to it. So they weren't the scientists that, that developed the technology. They were the they were the entrepreneurs that were going to commercialize it. And three entrepreneurs had a great idea, uh, still maybe the best idea of the group, and it was literally hundreds of ideas. And in their final slide, they presented that they were going to raise $3 billion, and um, uh, they were going to have complete control of their company. And I said, if you have to raise, first of all, you have to, have to raise $3 billion dollars that would be really hard to do in any short amount of period of time. And if you think you're going to still control your company, there's not too many examples of that. In fact, um, I can probably count them on less than one hand. Um, one of them is in our city, and it's Comcast. Uh, I don't know if they still control it, but they controlled the voting chairs for many years. <laughs> they didn't control the company, the ownership, but they controlled the voting, which was pretty impressive. Um, Facebook was another one who waited a long time to go public, and had similar controls. But there aren't too many other than that that have raised billions of dollars and controlled. And it's okay, because you need investment capital, you need others to help you grow your business. And along the way, are you gonna give up ownership control of your business? Yes, um, you will. Um, but as we like to say, it is better to have a small piece of a big pie than 100% of zero. And so it's critical to wrap your head around that. Um, you might want to talk to investors early on in the process and have this concern, well, they're going to steal my idea. I need, a, I need an NDA. I can't talk to you about my idea. And I agree. You do not want to talk to anybody until, number one, you have the patent process underway or you will ruin that whole process. So don't give away any, any ideas um, until that process is underway. And certainly even after that process is underway, I wouldn't share the inside uh, information, your idea, until you do have a document um, but you don't need to have those kinds of conversations from day one. You can have ideas, uh, excuse me, you can have ideas and you can have commercialization conversations before you get into that process. 
And so I'd encourage you to talk to people about your idea, get their input, get their ideas. You know, what patient population is this going to be focused on? What's really the size of my market? Will people pay for this? Is, will Jefferson actually pay for this? Do you think they will? Um, you know, have those kinds of conversations with people, not about the IP or the technology, the specific technology. Um, and it's not because people will steal your idea. Part of it is, you know, the, um, the actual IP process, which is an important element, element to it. Um, but it's, it's about sharing an appropriate amount of information um, at different stages. And when an investor is ready to delve deeper into the technology, you'll know. You'll know, they'll know, and you'll sign an appropriate document that allows them to do that you know, without having uh, your protections erased. Last one is VC is the only way to go. There is many other ways to raise capital. We've talked about a number of them here. We've talked about angel. We've talked about corporate. We talked a little bit about government grants. We didn't talk about crowdfunding. Um, and crowdfunding has really continued to grow. Um, crowdfunding, one example, is Kickstarter, or people that go out literally on public platforms and put their ideas out there and raise capital around them. Uh, most of them often are product-based, so somebody, idea, somebody has the idea about a specific product. A lot of them tend to be a little more consumer-focused. It could be healthcare-focused, but tend to be a little more consumer-focused. And a number of entities have had great success in raising couple hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, enough to get a prototype done or in some cases an initial beta product done um, for the market. So that crowdfunding there has become uh, a regulation, you know, regula it become regulated so that people can be, feel comfortable doing that in a legal way. Um, but it is a way to do so. Less so for the biotechnology or medical device space, more so for the information technology or even digital health space. And as I said, products often have had success as opposed to services. So there's a lot of ways to, to do so. Let me take a pause there. Any questions? Any questions from Abington? I'm going to switch slides. Don, how much time do we have? Perfect. Okay. Okay, great. So, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up these fresh charts, and uh, um, okay, and I'm going to thank my friends at KPMG for this, uh, Brian Hughes specifically, who uh, leads nationally their um, innovation practice, and uh, thanks to him for, for these charts. We talked about the size and scale of venture capital. This, this, this data grows nationally you know, and globally. Globally, 120, close to $130 billion and 8,000 deals. It's a lot. That's across all sectors, technology, healthcare. Um, we'll see what some of those are. And what are, the, what are some of the takeaways of, of this? So um, there have been a tremendous number of companies following the foots of Facebook, that have raised capital at huge valuations. They're called unicorns, independent companies with over a billion dollars of valuation. Um, and they continue to grow, but at a much slower pace. And there have been a number of well-known cases, increasingly well-known cases, of companies that were valued at a billion that are now raising capital just in the last two months below a billion dollars. So we've seen a fall of this mega round, um, this fall of the, the unicorn to a certain extent. We've also seen a fall off just in the ha second half of the year from an overall investment activity. And I'll show you some, um, some charts that show to that. Some signs of some seed fatigue. You know, those early investors that were rapidly putting money into early stage companies are star starting to slow down that pace. And the data shows that. Another interesting data point is that New York is now outpacing Massachusetts. Very surprising. Um, but there have been incredible amounts of activity in New York. And if you rewound the clock eight years, it wouldn't be that at all. It's a great case study, and I think it'll be a growing case study for how um, city governments can actually fund and seed some activity and see it spawn. But it's been an interesting thing and very, very positive thing that has happened. Um, by sector, so how does healthcare compare? Again, this is global data. We see the bottom line is internet and internet-related businesses count globally for close to 50% of all investment activity. And again, this is over the past five quarters. And you see healthcare um, is that, that uh, middle um, bar, the purple bar, if you can see that, that ranges from 12 to 13%. Oops. Boy, that's not good. I might need the uh, IT guy because it shows fine on my screen.
Did it just go off or was it never on? The first slide didn't come up? Hmm. Really? <laughs> hmm. Sorry for this. You know, just what? Let me go. Yeah, I'm going to talk through it, and I'll talk through it quickly so we can get to. Uh... Apologies for that. Okay, so <clears throat> the healthcare sec sector accounts globally for, for roughly 11 to 13%. A lot smaller. Again, really important activity. We talked about that. We're percentage of biotechnology. And if you look at um, the actual deal share in terms of uh, the actual number of companies, it's even more significant when you take in all technology. So all technology, internet, everything in there is close to 80%. So I talked about internet-related businesses, about 50%. Tech, the rest of technology is generally software, not internet-related software. It grows up to close to 80%. Again, compared to 11 to 13% in the, um, in the healthcare sector. Um, digital health, which has seen a, a, a large increase I started to see some decrease. Um, so just in the past five quarters, again, it's fallen off. And that's pretty much in line with the rest of the industry. Again, what we saw in terms of correction of public markets at the end of August, you know, played out in, in the private markets and well. When you look at North America as a market, I told you 130 billion globally. North America, 14 billion. Um, so that's how much was just raised, but in the fourth quarter alone. So in terms of size and scale, it's roughly you know, equal. So you're talking about North America being a significant chunk, about half of the world activity. North America remains you know, the leading part of the activity. Certainly there's activity in, in Europe and Asia, but North America by far outpaces. And in terms of outlook for 2016, there absolutely is, you know, there's concern. Um, there's concerns about the weakness of the public markets. And whenever you have weakness in the public markets, you have questions from private investors on whether or not they can get their pump companies public. Well, the answer right now is no. And so when that's no, as investors, they tend to look at their own portfolio and say, okay, I got to focus on my own portfolio and how much they're going to need until the public markets open up rather than focusing on investment in new innovations. And so that's happening right now, and that's why we see you know, a fall off and decrease. Um, in terms of that trend, again, over the last five years, we hit a peak, a peak in the terms of the number of deals in 2015, 14, sorry, and a peak in terms of the number of dollars in, in 15. And both of those are trending down. Um, again, has everything to do with what we've seen going on in the world, econ world economy, within our own public markets, uh, et cetera, just over the past couple of months. Um, there's less money in seed stage. We talked about that. That was one of the, um, one of the findings, that that is shrinking as a piece of the pie. Um, corporates. I talked about uh, this earlier. What percentage do you think of overall investment activity? This is North America. Is corporate. Anybody want to take a shot at it? What percentage? It's 25, 25%. It's pretty significant because keep in mind when you're in those boardrooms and those CEOs are talking to their boards, I don't think they're probably leading with, hey, uh, we've got significant venture capital activity. I think pretty much the boards want to hear about you know, what, what's the results of their products, their profitability, what are they doing to produce more. And so this is an element of it, but it's pretty significant from an industry perspective. Some 
don't always welcome it, you know, because it can be challenging to have a corporate very close to your private company. It can prevent you from having relationships with other corporates that are their competitors. But what I find is that the companies that do it well can engage multiple corporate investors in some cases. And even if they're not able to do that, it doesn't hamper their ability to grow their business and ultimately uh, drive and grow the innovation. Active investors, some of the most active, the most active investors, New Enterprise Associates, NEA, which is headquartered just south of here in Baltimore, but has large activity out in the Silicon Valley. Um, they do both healthcare and technology, but most others that are on the top of the list, as you might gauge from the information I just shared with you, do exclusively technology. So the healthcare or healthcare only funds are f much further down the list of the top or the most uh, active funds around the country. And I really only took a look at kind of the top 25, but uh, again, there are only a handful that do healthcare, NEA being one of the largest. Um, uh, I'm looking at, uh, somebody had asked about the scale of California. For, um, from a deal activity perspective, California um, did a couple thousand deals last year. Um, and I say California really focuses epicenter is, is Northern California. Um, compared to New York and Massachusetts, which weren't even 25% of that. Um, and we're about five, not even 5%. So that gives you an idea of scale. Um, you know, California, again, about two, over 2,000 investments a year. So it just, you know, it's hard to compare yourself. You know, someone said, let's stop talking about this region being the Silicon Valley of whatever, because it's just not a fair comparison. We're, our, we're ourselves, and we're having great successes, and can increasingly point to those. Um, and that's it. Um, uh, I want to just, there was a point at which I wanted to ask you a question, and I thought, oh, I'll hold this until later. So, um, so you and I are both familiar with what the Commonwealth has done in the past and what they may do. Um, so I'd be curious, given all the budget hoopla of last year, what from your lobbyist's point of view did that mean in terms of rubber meets the road in that budget cycle and offer a prediction about what's going to happen in this budget cycle. And, by, and don't feel bad about it because everybody's offering predictions and nobody has any idea, including the people there. So if you would, please. Um, so you have to understand that we were coming from a desert, right? So uh, previous administration was a complete desert. And you know, we had major fiscal issues to, to deal with. But there were literally was no money flowing from the Commonwealth into the sector. And Ben Franklin has been kind of a large, a large recipient of it for many years, and that was one of the first and, f first and foremost focuses that we had. Interesting story, when we uh, set out to propose Innovate PA and get it passed, we were doing so in collaboration with Ben Franklin, and we each had our own lobbyists. Through that process, our lobbyists decided to merge their entities and become one because they worked so well together, and that had a lot to do with it. But you know, what does that mean? Um, the money that we were able to, to free up through that tax credit bill just started flowing this past year, uh, actually in this budget cycle, so July 1st. And so Ben Frank was an initial recipient, and then they started putting money into certain funds. And as of right now, a little bit less than $20 million has been committed to about a half a dozen funds, which is great. You don't know about that. You haven't heard that because the state, the Commonwealth, does not want to let people know through PR means that we're doing all these great things because they don't have a budget. Um, so they're, that's one thing, you know, so we can't, we can't like start, you know, building on the momentum of this great behind the scenes story because we don't have a budget. So that's a little bit of a challenge. Is there interest and in activity and discussions about what's next? Yes, but they all end with the, we don't have a budget, so we can't do that yet.